Okay, lots to talk about today and joining me is Nationals Senator Perrin Davey and Labor frontbencher Amanda Rishworth. Thanks for your time. Great to be with you. Now, I want to get on to the big you know, agenda items in Parliament, but can we just start with the security issue? Rhys Kershaw there talking about officers inventing threats about federal parliamentarians, or parliamentarians, I should say. Amanda Rishworth, you have been in this building since 2007. Uh, what Has anything changed security-wise for you? Well, not for me personally. Um, nothing has changed uh, for me. There is no doubt that... Um, uh, uh, there is heightened concern, I think, um, in the community and uh, within parliamentarians uh, around security. There's um, some, uh, yeah, some concerns out there, but nothing's changed for me personally. And well, it's great news. I'm pleased to hear that, Perrin Davy. Um, you've uh, been here for this term of parliament. Um, are you concerned about your safety? You've got any reason to be more concerned? Personally, uh, no. I have the luxury of being in a very regional community. Um, where everyone knows everyone. But I I will say that um, it is heightened at the moment, the conversations are heightened, but it is actually not new. I remember going to uh, community hall meetings where um, photos heads were thrown on the stage against bureaucrats. I remember when Tony Burke was threatened as water minister. I've seen uh, effigies of Minister Littleproud thrown into the Murray River. Um, it cannot be condoned, regardless of what the issue is, whether it is water policy, climate change or vaccinations and freedoms. Violence should never be condoned. Do you think the PM um, got into hot water last week because it looked like he was in some ways condoning the protests when he said he understands why people are angry and frustrated? I think there was a lot of semantics going on around what the Prime Minister said. On the one hand, he said violence can't be condoned and then someone said, but he didn't use the word condemn, so he doesn't condemn it. And I, I think that is sort of clutching at straws to try and make something out of what I thought he was very clear, that violence should never be tolerated. In Australia, we have a right for peaceful protests, but peaceful protests is what it should stay as. I mean, I, I would disagree. I think in these heightened scenarios, there needs to be an unequivocal statement, and the Prime Minister needed, at this point, to have an unequivocal statement to say that he condemned these protests and uh, the, uh, the, you know, the... the pictures of the gallows, those sorts of things, were very, very upsetting, not just for members of parliament. I think it was very upsetting for the community. And we need to, at this time, bring the community together. Should have been unequivocally condemned, in my view, and he didn't do that. Do you think there was a deliberate pivot in the answer that he gave? He said, on the one hand, um, frustration cannot be an excuse for violence. And on the other hand, he said, but I understand why people are frustrated. I, I do think he was trying to say two messages out there. Um, I don't believe that his statements, uh, if they were thought through, were about bringing the community together. I know he doesn't get on with Premier Andrews. Um, clearly there's been stouches in the media. This was unacceptable, whether he was trying to send a message to people that didn't like him or try and relate to them. It was unacceptable and he should have condemned it outright. Just in terms of what you were saying earlier about whether um, the this, this situation has changed, Bruce Kershaw in his um, Grab We Played said that there were a number of factors that have changed recently in terms of the uh, security environment that we're in. What are the kind of factors that you think have led to these recent sort of anti-government protests? Oh, well, I mean, certainly we've seen very concerning incidences of violence uh, overseas. We've seen the terrible and tragic circumstances in the UK. We saw the January 6 riots in America that we hope would never be repeated here. But there does seem to be an increasing furor uh, and it, an increasing fever pitch amongst these protests. And the unfortunate thing is there are many uh, people who are out there and they take to the streets to in peaceful protest and they are getting swarmed and surrounded by uh, uh, some really horrific scenes. You know, the, I agree, the nooses should not be tolerated at all and those sorts of scenes can't be tolerated. Uh, so we do need to really hammer home the message that uh, peaceful protest is allowable. But violence, threats of violence and the increasing use of social media to threaten public officials, not just parliamentarians, but also, and our staff, I'm not sure about Amanda, but, you know, some of the phone calls that come mm. into our offices are just horrendous and my staff should not have, have to deal with that.
Not at all. And actually, interestingly, Mark McGowan, as we I mentioned a short time ago, the West Australian Premier has actually had to shut his electorate mm. office. Like, can you imagine having to do that because of the threats that are being levelled against him and his staff? Well, that is absolutely unacceptable for those staff who are who are serving the public. But more importantly, that is a small minority affecting democracy. Actually, shutting down. You should be able to have access to your member of parliament to do a range of things, to advocate on your behalf, to help you through Centrelink process or the range of issues that come. The fact that these people think it's OK to stop others being off to having access to their elected official uh, is appalling. So they are a blight on our democracy uh, and it is terrible for the staff uh, that, um, you know, it do their best to help people every single day uh, of the week. Um, so I, I just would say this is absolutely appalling behaviour and has no place in Australia. We've seen some of... Uh, it, it seems some of the tactics are being imported um, from uh, groups uh, within America. I, I haven't had any specific advice, but it seems some of the tactics are. Um, I protest talking about... Um, uh, you know, Amendment 14 of the Constitution, which is actually the American Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, it has no place here in Australia. We have had a peaceful democracy here in Australia and I hope it remains the same for a long time to come. Yeah, don't we all? Well, let's move on to the priority bill for this fortnight and that is the Religious Discrimination Bill. Um, Perrin Davey, do you think that there is a problem here that needs to be solved with this legislation? Uh, look, this was a commitment that our government took to the last election and we did so because it was being called for. There were people who felt that their religious rights were being undermined and weren't protected. Even though so, there's very few examples of that, though, isn't there? It's, it's a feeling as opposed to actually having evidence of that. And across the board, when you look at all of our d discrimination rules and rights, uh, it, they're few and far between cases of some of the discrimination, but we've got laws to protect people's rights. And I think that the, it is absolutely time that in this country, because people must remember this is just about Christian religion or any particular isolated religion. This is about protecting the rights of any practitioner of any religion to be able to practice their faith their way. Amanda Richworth, now we haven't seen the details. Um, I don't think Labor has yet been briefed either. So we are talking, you know, broadly about the concept of this. But uh, Jacinta Collins, a former colleague of yours, reckons that Labor should back it in, in terms of the, the, the principle of it. Where do you stand? Well, look, I, well, Labor's been very clear from the time the government announced this, you know, what, three and a half years ago, that we were willing to work on a religious... Uh, oh, a, a, anti-discrimination bill. Um, happy to work on it, but it hasn't proceeded in a bipartisan way. There hasn't been a lot of consultation. I haven't seen uh, any iteration of this bill. It hasn't been made public as of yet. We've seen previous uh, bills, um, but we've hear rumours that there is change. So, look, we'll look at the detail, but it hasn't been done in a way that has been bipartisan. And that concerns me, because it concerns me because I believe the Prime Minister uh, seems to want to play politics with this instead of actually reaching across the aisle and actually talking with Labor about what this might look like. So I've been really disappointed that uh, this is has taken so far to so long to get here. We are on the eve of an election. It was an election commitment. It seems like the Prime Minister wants to rush this through, has not been bipartisan about it, hasn't wanted to really work in good faith um, and that is concerning. So we'll take a look at it of course. Um, when it comes. We've said we were interested in working with the government on this, but it hasn't happened. And now it seems to be rushed just so the Prime Minister can fulfil an election promise without careful consideration. Well, Perrin it's kind of fair criticism, right? You did promise this in 2019 at the election. Three years later, this could actually be the final sitting fortnight and before another election. Look, uh, yeah, promised it three years ago. And we have taken three years consulting and preparing. As Amanda said, people have seen previous drafts and those previous drafts were put out for public consultation. We uh, heard the commentary of the Labor Party. We've taken that on board. We've spoken to religious representatives from across the board. We've taken their feedback on board. We've heard from the LGBTQI community as well. So it, that is why it's taken this long, because we are taking on board all of the feedback we're getting. This bill is too important to have rushed and got through. You know, we needed that time to consult constructively 
and appropriately with everyone. Yes, now people are saying, well, it looks like it's a last minute thing. This is a bill three years in the making, three years of consultation in the making, and I think it's appropriate when we're talking about something this significant. So you've got eight days left of this um, sitting fortnight. It's not yet clear whether we'll be returning next year. It all depends on the election. If this bill doesn't at least go to a vote, would that be a broken promise? Well, uh, it's before the House of Representatives first and then hope, hopefully it will pass there and then come to the Senate. How the Senate deals with it, whether the Senate wants to refer it to a committee is entirely up to the Senate chamber. We don't control the Senate. Um, if it goes to committee, it will be reviewed, but hopefully we can have it back um, very quickly. Hopefully it would be a short turnaround, respecting the amount of consultation that has already occurred. OK, well, Amanda Rishworth, just on the issue of um, Labor and religion more broadly, at the last election, Labor suffered some big swings against it in Western Sydney, in parts of Queensland. One theory at the time, offered by some of your colleagues, in fact, was that Labor was performing poorly in areas where religion was really alive and well. Uh, I suppose heading towards the next election and looking at a bill like this, does it make you sort of more favourable to support this kind of bill, to sort of prove to voters of faith that Labor, you know, supports them among others? Well, I don't think we look at this bill as some sort of voting uh, votes. We look at the principle. And as we've said three years ago, we are open to looking at enshrining uh, freedom of religion. Um, we've, we've said that. It needs to be balanced up against other discrimination uh, laws in this country. It needs to be worked through carefully and consistently and that is why in the actual this iteration of this bill we've been disappointed the government hasn't wanted to work with us. So uh, we don't uh, look at this uh, as some sort of vote grabbing exercise. We look at this as an important vote, uh, important issue of principle. Um, it needs to be carefully considered. It is uh, you know, it, it could have uh, important ramifications and we need to be clear about what those are. And that, as I said I haven't seen the bill. Um, it hasn't been made public yet so so to think that uh, the final bill would then be rushed through because uh, we haven't seen it is 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 quite disappointing, and and that has been echoed uh, in uh, of religious leaders as we have been concerned that the uh, that the government hasn't reached across the aisle to discuss this. And just before we let you guys go to question time, um, Pauline Hanson's bill to effectively override state vaccine mandates was defeated today pretty comprehensively. Um, are you sort of relieved or pleased that this bill didn't actually get through so that states have the power to do whatever they want to do when it comes to vaccine mandates? Well, well firstly, I'd say I don't know why the debate was brought on. I mean, uh, the government uh, has many issues, as we said, including uh, religious uh, uh, discrimination bills in front of the parliament, so I'm not sure why the government agreed to bring this bill on for debate. But what I would say is the states and territories have been doing the hard lifting when it comes to protecting our communities here in Australia. And they have done a really important job based on medical advice uh, about protecting our communities. So I think we need to continue to respect the medical advice, uh, respect the work the states and territories have done. And I, I really don't like the Prime Minister's tactic of taking uh, taking the praise when it comes to the vaccine, uh, vaccine high vaccine numbers, and then at the same time. Uh you know, in some ways, his comments undermining them. It's it's not good enough. The states and territories have been acting on medical advice. It is a very, very difficult time, but it's a very crucial time as we open our borders to get this right, and the states and territories have been acting on that medical advice, and they should be supported to do that. Well, Karen Davy, you voted against the Pauline Hanson bill, I assume, because you're not on the paper as I'm supporting it. But what do you say to your colleagues like Alex Antic and Jared Rennick, who are saying, you know... Morrison, you need to uh, ban these mandates or we're not going to vote for your for our government's bills. Like, it's a pretty childish approach, isn't it? Uh, well, look, um, and, and uh, threats against the government, threats against the government's agenda don't necessarily get us anywhere. But I, I will also say... Um, Barnaby Joyce was quite right when he says if the states have implemented a mandate, uh, it, it is the state's... State government's issue. So if you can't get a coffee at the coffee shop because you're unvaccinated, that's a state government rule. Um, Amanda is absolutely right. The state governments are following their health advice. I commend New South Wales who've got a clear end date in sight. New South Wales have got uh, different rules for vaccinated and unvaccinated at the moment. 
But they've also said, come the 15th of December, it doesn't matter whether you're vaccinated or not, we will uh, have consistent restrictions in place. I believe Queensland is working towards a similar strategy. They're just so far away from being 80% vaccinated yet that they can't even contemplate it. So what we need is people to get out and get vaccinated if they can so that we can get to the 80% rate, so that we can follow the national plan out of coach was agreed by the National Cabinet and all state premiers. Yep, absolutely. Well, on that, right, on that note, I should say, Perry and Debbie, Amanda Rishwa, yes. thanks for your time. Thank you. Well, on that, right, on that note, I should say, Perry and Debbie, Amanda Rishwa, yes. thanks for your time. Thank you. Authorised by Perry and Debbie, the Nationals, Daniloquin.